Hi, everybody. Uh, to, do, to those who do not know me, I am David Basson. Many of my childhood friends know me as Khudr. I was born in Baghdad in 1949, finished my schooling in 1966, and graduated from the University of Baghdad in 1970. I left Iraq by passport in January 1972 to England, where I did my postgraduate studies in, in 1995, I emigrated to Israel. Over the last 18 months, I have been collecting testimonies and stories of the exit from Iraq from members of the Jewish community that remained in Iraq after the 1950 1951 mass emigration to Israel. I have been concentrating on the period from the mid 60s and early 70s. The aim is to publish a book with the title A New Hope, which will be sponsored by the Aguda, whose aim is to promote literary works, memoirs, and research by and about the Jews of Iraq via books, seminars, and conferences. To date, we published 70 books. In collecting the written stories and talking for dozens of hours with people, my aim is to tell the heroic attempts of those who sought freedom from oppression. Of course, and inevitably, all the stories have their own personal angle, particularly when resurrecting memories that were buried for half a century whether in recording dates, describing specific events and people, and finally their interpretation of what they saw or heard from parents and friends. You will find stories that range from chaotic attempts to escape by contacting Kurdish contacts to a very well organized process, from almost cost-free to having to pay significant amount of money from crossing the Iraqi-Iranian borders in cars and within hours of getting to North Iraq, to taking days of traveling on mules or donkeys and walking in snow. You may find anger because of certain incidents such as not giving routes of escape to others, the threads and chains that were cut prematurely, as well as external elements that influence the efficiency of the escape process. I'm not sitting here as a judge, but one has to remember what an awful period we lived in those years, the fear that everyone had of being personally or one of his family members being the next victim, whether being imprisoned, tortured, or even killed, dominated our thinking. My role as a researcher is to unravel the chain of events and discover the threads as objectively as one can be, plug any holes and chronological mistakes or missynchronization in these stories and give an overall view. My work can only be successful with the cooperation of those who escaped or were involved in the process in providing me with all the information that they can remember about themselves, families and friends who were with them in their escape journeys or whom they helped. I ask hence everyone who was involved to write to me or call me. We still really do not know the exact number of those who escaped. It ranges between 1,500 and 2,000. And that is a guess from a community of around 3,000. I thank everybody to who contributed to date. In the next 10 minutes or so, I will set up the historical background sketch the different routes of escape and concentrate on the problematic year of 1970. Then I will ask five speakers to describe their experience and routes of escape. So let us have a quick look at the historical background though, to those who are unfamiliar with it. Post 1967 Six Day War, the residual Jewish community in Iraq of 3000 suffered the worst and the longest period of persecution. Several do dozens were arrested, some were tortured, and severe restriction on movement and economic activities were initiated. Uh, clubs fired their Jewish members, home phones were cut, import licenses were revoked, 
Jews were fired from their jobs and private companies whose finishing their, those finishing their secondary education were not allowed to enter universities. In 1968, the Ba'ath came to power led by Bakr and Saddam and soon the persecution intensifies. Many Jews were arrested in November 1968 and trialed on fabricated spying charges. January 1969 was a black day when nine Jews were hanged and bodies were displayed in public squares in Baghdad and Basra to the attendance of half a million cheering people. From 1968 to 1973, over 50 people were killed. In addition to the nine, another three were hanged, seven died in torture, dozens disappeared without a trace, and the family of the Qashqush was slaughtered, family of five in their home in April 73. In summer 1970, Jews started escaping via Iraqi Kurdistan to Iran and then to Israel and the rest of the world. This is the story that we are going to tell. The rest at the end of 1971 left with passport. Still some people actually escaped. By 1975, number of Jews were less than 300 and today are handful. Having described this terrible environment, all Iraqi Jews and particularly the young one were desperate to leave at any cost if the opportunity arises. Now we have several stories running together that I managed to unravel and I hope, and some of you may know them, I can describe them without complicating the picture. In the 1960s and throughout the 1970s, Israel gave assistance to the Kurds under the leadership of Mustafa al-Barazani via Iran under the Shah, ranging from medical to military training and intelligence, as well as selling military equipment. Iran and Israel had very good commercial, military, and intelligence relations those days, and the Mossad operated in Iran and cooperated with the Iranians. Following the 1969 hanging of Iraqi Jews, Golda Meir asked Tzvit Amir, the head of the Mossad, to do what he can to extricate the Jews of Iraq. So he traveled to Iran and met with the Shah and his government and intelligence people and asked them to facilitate the entry of Iraqi Jews once they had the opportunity to escape. To this they agreed. At the same time, he also met with the Barazani and asked for the Kurdish help in smuggling Iraqi Jews when the opportunity arise. At that time, there was a war raging between the Iraqi army and the rebel Kurds seeking autonomy and equal rights. The opportunity for the Jews to escape availed itself when the Iraqi government signed a, a ceasefire and a truce with the rebel Kurds in March 1970, ending all military hostilities. Though the road from Baghdad to the north was full of Iraqi checkpoints and military posts, people could now travel to the north on the basis of internal tourism. In fact, many Jews used to travel in the 50s and 60s in the summer to the resorts of North Iraq to enjoy the cool summer air and the amazing natural views. Northern Iraq is a very rugged and mountainous area with some of the mountains rising to 3000 meters high and connecting with the mountains of Southeast Turkey and East Iran. Some Iraqi Jews escaped during the years 1964 to 1967, largely via Shat al-Arab south in Basra but this route became very difficult and with the constant watchful eye of the Mukhabarat and al amin the security agencies, no Jews, as far as I am aware, attempted this route after 1967 Six-Day War. There were a few individuals or families who escaped via Khanaqin in the East, like Dr. Gurji Rabi' family and Samir Sayyid in September 1967, believe it or not, or via the desert route or bypassing Badra and Jassan taking, taken by Joyce Hakam and her husband Zuhair and several other families. 
But the majority, however, escaped via two routes that we will describe today, one via Erbil and the other via Slemania in the north. At some stage, it's not clear when, or probably as early as the beginning of 1970 in Israel, they started collecting names and letters of from families that had relatives in Iraq. The aim was to send reliable people to contact the head of families in Baghdad and to tell them that once they succeed in getting to Erbil in North Iraq, they can escape with the help of the Kurds. Everything was arranged on the Kurdish side of the border and in Iran. What I understood that on the Israeli side, they had little idea about where the Jews lived in terms of the wide area between Batawin and Mesbah and their status. They were probably still thinking of the old Jewish area in Baghdad. You can just come to a one area and just tell them to go out. Now back to the main story. The first one, as far as we are aware, who took advantage of the so-called freedom of travel into the north and managed after several visits to find a smuggler who would help him escape was the late Fuad Max Saudari. On June the 9th, 1970, he left to the north by car with his wife and two little daughters via Kirkuk, Erbil, to the resort of Salah al-Din, where he contacted the smuggler known as, a, as Dawood and met other smugglers from a tribe which was anti-Barazani. Instead of a smooth and short journey, they had a very hard journey climbing mountains and crossing valleys on mules and walking, arriving to the border after six days of continuous travel on the night of the 14th of June. In Iran, he was arrested and interrogated and mistreated for several days thinking that he was a spy or an Iraqi officer until the 20th of June, when an Iranian Jews vouched for him in a small town called Razia. He eventually got to Tehran, where he was debriefed by the Mossad to hear the story of his escape and get information on Jewish families in Baghdad. The story of the escape and detailed diary he kept from prior to Six Day War was published in a book waiting to be hanged and is available online. The news of Saudi's successful, though difficult escape, triggered many of the Iraqi Jews to try to escape via Kurdistan. Many were looking for Kurdish contact and going to the north, wandering in the different cities, villages, and, report, and resorts, looking for Kurdish smugglers to take them, not knowing that there is a semi-official route already arranged between the Israelis, Kurds, and Iran. On the 7th of August, 1970, the Zilcha family with Yusuf Shina left Baghdad to Slemania route, managed to cross the border and arriving to Tehran after a week. Shina was debriefed in the Israeli consulate in Iran, and then information was sent to his father, Nassim Shina, about the Arbil Hajj Umran, Umran escape route. Yusuf will tell you the story. Meanwhile, Jews began flocking to the north. Some of them succeeded in crossing the border via contacts they established. I'm talking about the Erbil route. At the end of August and early September, like Maurice Khlasci and family, who later passed the news to some of his relatives, Dr. Ihsan Samra and Farid Samra families, who left soon after that, as well families such as the Khlef, who were looking for smugglers, Maurice sent information to Stadis Haq. Other families used this route and managed to cross the border in early September, such as Shina and his partner, based on the information that he received. Salman Masri group and many others, and I'm still trying to collect names, as well as Shohat family, Maurice Shohat will talk about their group successful escape using the same route. But soon disaster fell on the Jews attempting to escape. Dozens of Jews arrived from the end of August to mid-September to the north, largely concentrating in the resort of Shaklawa and Salah al-Din with very obvious presence and some of them very indiscreet looking for smugglers. There is no time to get into detail, but in summary, 
the government found out and rounded 136 Jews on the 16th of September and brought them back to Baghdad for interrogation. Now you can imagine the situation of trying to get rid of any indication that they were planning to escape. Some of the detainees were subjected to torture. They stayed for more than two weeks before they were released with bail arranged by the Jewish lawyer Abdul Aziz, who was kidnapped, in fact, in 1972 and disappeared without any trace. Escape via the Arbil route ceased almost completely with a few exceptional personal attempts. I was told by a reliable source that, in fact, Barazani was afraid after Saddam threatened him with opening military action again. In a sense, the government knew about the escape and the Kurdish help. Individual endeavors to escape by identifying smugglers resumed in November and December 1970 via the Suleimania route, which was more difficult, particularly with winter approaching. Khalid Musa gave information about a smuggler he managed to contact to many families who escaped via this route before his own escape. Others found their own way via other contacts. Nazar will describe his escape via this route. As far as I can ascertain, as of now, the news about the difficulty of this Suleimania route became apparent, and I have not heard of anyone leaving in the first few months of 1971, but I will uh, be corrected if anyone will tell me that. In July 1971, a southern eastern desert difficult route bypassing Bedra and Jassan was used by two groups. Joyce will describe this route. And finally, escape via the Arbil Hajj Umran route to Iran was resumed when Naim Attar was informed of it. His children were the first to use it in July 1971 and he helped organize the escape of dozen families in about two and a half months, July to September 1971, hundreds of Jews escaped in a very organized and civil way to Iran. Lili Shore will describe this route, which is the same route that before, but a different time and different organization. By the late 1971, the Iraqi government started slowly issuing passport and throughout the early 1970s, Iraqi Jews took advantage of traveling to Istanbul and from there to Israel or to other destination such as via Lebanon to England, Netherlands, Canada and the United States. I left many details because of the limited time, but I will include it in the book that I hope will be published in the second half of this year. Now I will call on the panel speakers one by one to tell his story. Before that, I will share a screen with you to show you different routes. And when each speaker talks, I will show his or her route. Google map of today can help, but remember it was 50 years ago. So some of the villages, some of the villages such as Darband, which came all the time, people talking about it, where many people met their contact were destroyed by Saddam and then as well and well as bombed during the Iraqi Iranian war of the 1980s. If time permits at the end, I will also show some short videos about the routes, but uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to share a screen and tell me if you see it. Uh, okay, can you see the screen? Yes, it's okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank so you. The, these are uh, the basic routes. This is North Iraq. This is Mosul. People may know, or some people may know them. Or, or, sorry, most of the Iraqis will know them. Some other may not necessarily know where they are. This is Mosul. This is Erbil. This is Slemania. This is Baghdad. Okay. Now, uh, basically, all that area around here is Kurdish. So the route that we were talking about from Baghdad to Slemania via Kirkuk and then from Slemania, most likely 
This is the route they took to Panjouin and crossing uh, to Iran. This was a problematic route, very ill-defined in terms of people not knowing exactly where they are. Uh, they cannot, I haven't heard anybody identifying for me any place. Remember all of these, most of the people went, all of them went at night in a very bad conditions, nothing, they do, just, just don't know where they are. The other route was to Erbil and from Erbil to Hajj Omran and uh, basically crossing the border to Iran from there. The road that the, the, the one which I described by a Khanaqin, which a few family took, by the way, this is a road which many Jews were uh, smuggled before the Tasqiyat in the 1940s, is the Khanaqin route. And then the last road which I described was the one which took, was taken by uh, Joyce and, and, and uh, other families is via the Bedra and Jassan to the east, which is the desert route. I did not include here the Shat al-Arab because nobody really in the period that we are talking about uh, went, which is well south. Okay. Now, once you get, once you got to the, uh, the border, basically this is how you actually went to Tehran. It's quite far away. Uh, it's hundreds of kilometers away. Some of them went by uh, the train, by car, several stations, by bus, and so on. But this is basically, as you can see here, that is Hajj Omran, that's Penjouin, that's Khanaqin, that's basically the border with Badra. And this is the way that you will get to Tehran. Okay. So now uh, I call on uh, the different people to start uh, talking. Dawood, can you open, please, the microphone for Yusuf Shina? Okay, Yusuf, please go ahead. So the story was uh, like this. The Zilcha family and uh, Odi, and uh, uh, God bless his soul, uh, uh, Jamal and uh, uh, Norma, and, uh, they were all leaving to, you know, uh, they wanted to leave uh, and escape. And they, uh, Jamal was working for a Turkish, a Kurdish guy at the time. And they gave him a connection in the north. And they went, uh, they, so they knew I, we were very good friends and they knew I, I wanted to leave. So they came to my parents and they asked them if, they, if I would, if they would let me live with them, and because of the fear of being captured or or uh, finding out that I left, uh, my parents said uh, no, and they went to the north. And as you described before, uh, the road was. Uh, not clear and they didn't find a way to leave. So they came back to Baghdad. And I went, and then they went again and they asked my dad if I could go and, I, and he said yes. And that's when we left uh, to Sulaimania. And then there is a town on the border which is called Penjouin. And I'm not sure uh, if we, stayed in Penjouin or, or, or uh, in Sulaimania, but from Penjouin, we went on mules to a, a small town in Iran, which I think took about, from Penjouin to the border of Iran, about uh, maybe a, a, a couple of hours, I would say, uh, maybe a, I can't remember exactly, but, uh, and when we got to the border of Iran, the, the smuggler said, now you, you know, you uh, just walk to that uh, police station over there and tell them you are Kalimian, which means Jewish in Persian. So, that's exactly what we did. We walked to the police station and we told them that we are Kalimian. And it seems like after Fuad Saudai 
left, they were aware that Jews were gonna leave Iraq. So they treated us, you know, they welcomed us, they treated us well, they put us in a hotel. And from there, they didn't know what to do with us exactly. But uh, they contacted Tehran and we stayed in a hotel for a couple of days and then we moved to, from Pashmach to Marijuan to Senendej. And I think we stayed in a hotel in Senendej and then from Senendej, we went to Tehran. And at that time, the Jews were staying at uh, the Sinai Hotel. And I stayed uh, at uh, the Dalal family, uh, Moshi Dalal, who used to live there and used to be partners with my dad in Iraq uh, before 1950. Uh, Yusuf, who did you see there of Jews that already arrived? Oh, I saw Valda, I saw the Halaschis, I saw, uh, but they were not there yet. Yeah. I saw yeah, them yeah, after, they, they were, I was, uh, only at the I, end of I, August. We left uh, on uh, August 7th. So on August 7th, we were already in Iran. We arrived in Iran on August 7th. And uh, from there, it took about 14 day, uh, seven days to get to Tehran. So let's say the 14th of August. And they came later. Uh, but that's where everybody was staying. So I used to come to uh, Hotel Sinai just to see them after, you know, when they came to ask about my father. But as you said, I was debriefed at the time by the uh, Israeli consulate, and they asked me to write a letter to my dad, and they assured me that I was safe, and they will get uh, the letter delivered to him. And uh, I hesitated, but then Moshe Dalal at the time assured me that I could, I could trust them and. I don't have to worry about anything. I just can say what, whatever I want. So I wrote actually a couple of letters and uh, Hodor, you have copies of my letters that my dad brought back to me after he, he left uh, 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 Iraq. And uh, the, somebody went to my so our, our uh, uh, escape was, I would call it very, very easy and wasn't complicated. Our escape, I don't know about, you know, the, the route itself, but we, we escaped from Baghdad, uh, from, from the North very quickly to Iran. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, once we arrived in Iran, uh, it was, you know, everything was fine. Uh, you and, please tell us yes. about uh, what happened when your father got your letters. And as I understand about 30 letters. Yes, yeah, so, 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 the, so uh, uh, the Israelis had asked other people to write letters. A lot of them were living in Israel. And uh, some of them had, you know, from, uh, different families uh, who had families in Iraq and including some, some letters from my, uh, my uncle and my aunt uh, who were living in Israel and, and they, who left in 1950. And uh, uh, this uh, gentleman uh, went to my father and he asked for him by name. And he said, I have something to deliver to you. And he gave him a bunch of letters, uh, probably 30 of them from families uh, in Israel. And two of them were from me. 
And uh, the contents of the, of the letters were disturbing because some of them described Israel, described other things. Uh, and you know, the situation in Iraq wasn't <laughs> uh, a safe situation. So my father thought about it and, and decided to take the letters and burn them. He looked at who, you know, what the, who the names are and everything else. And then he just put them, uh, you know, in 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 in, fi in a fire, and he burned all the letters. My letters were very, uh, uh, you know, they, they didn't have any uh, names and didn't have any reference to Israel or anything else. So he kept my letters. And the gentleman told him, whenever you want to leave, you go to, as you described, to Arbil. And from Arbil, there was a route, you know, you, you identify yourself and, and we'll take you out. So my father, I believe, told uh, Naim Attar about the route. And, uh, and maybe a few other people, I'm not sure really. And then he decided he, had, he didn't have any in mind to leave at all. So then he decided that he wanted to leave. He didn't want to stay anymore. And he spoke to his partners and told them, listen, I'm leaving. If you want to leave, you come with me. If you don't want to leave, uh, uh, it's fine. You can stay. So they all said they wanted to leave. And they followed that route and actually uh, Anwar Paris, and I see Yusuf Debbie is uh, uh, with us here. So he was one of the people who actually uh, left with them at that time. Uh, so I, I'm not sure of the date exactly, but they left. And Anwar Paris actually left with his car and he came to Iran with his car. And they took the car at the time and then uh, eventually they released the car to him. But my father, when he arrived uh, 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 by train to Tehran, they, they were the Israeli consulate, uh, the representative or the council was waiting for him at the train station and immediately took him immediately to the consulate to debrief him and ask him about the letters. And he told them, I, well, I, I burned the letters. So they asked him if he was ever a spy or if he ever worked as a spy because they were concerned about these letters. Once they sent them, they realized that they had made a mistake by sending all these letters with all these references. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, I, you know, we, we all left uh, to Israel. I stayed in Israel for one year and from, I was at the Technion at the time. And then I came to New York and I studied at, at NYU and now I'm here still. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Yusuf. As uh, of, of course, uh, you are very aware that the whole incident uh, caused a lot of anger, but uh, you explain the reasons and uh, uh, people has to take your word or whatever they think. I, we're not here to change minds. No, but, no absolutely. But as I mentioned, we people have to think at what what terrible period that we were there and uh, how sensitive such information could uh, be disastrous to many people if they fell in the wrong hand. Okay, thank you, Yusuf. Uh, now, Maurice, uh, please... Uh, Go uh, expand your uh, your route, which is uh, the Erbil Hajj Omran route. But in 1970, when this route, strictly speaking, was the semi-official route, already uh, you know arranged by the Kurds and Israelis and the Iranian, but uh, not many people knew about it. Just a few people knew about this official route and the code and all this kind of thing. But you, as you told me, you you did it your own way. Okay, Maurice. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, we can hear you. I unmuted you. Thanks. Uh, as you said, Maurice, Maurice, fix your camera, please. Lift your head. And, and uh, please, Maurice, uh, stick with about 10 minutes, okay? Try. Uh, we decided to leave Iraq, of course, in uh, August uh, 1970. We approached my maternal uncle and a couple of other uh, friends, individuals who quickly agreed in turn to join us. And it was our Jewish neighbor, Dr. Najiru Ben Kuhan, who fled the country a few days earlier together with his wife, their three children, and his in-laws provided us with a smuggler's name and address that they used. Following their arrival in Iran, he sent us a pre-accepted word with an emissary from those who smuggled them. And the word that he that we, are, we agreed upon ahead of time, uh, it was that, you know, the interpretation was that the route was very difficult, but we decided to take the risk. It was September 2nd, 1970. We left Baghdad, 13 people. It was around 4 a.m. and took taxis and traveled to the town of Shaklawa in the Arbil Kurdish district. Our goal yeah, was it's here. I'm sorry. No, I'm just saying to people to see it on the map. Our goal was Jamil's coffee place. That's the place that we're told to go to. Jamil was obviously a Kurdish. Uh, that was our destination. After traveling for about six hours, we arrived at the provided address. It was a small coffee and restaurant place. The owner, Jamil, received us and we were hidden in the restaurant side room for five days. Of course, we paid him the amount he asked for to smuggle us to Iran. On September 7th- uh, Sorry, Maurice, you mentioned you were one of the people who paid very heavily in terms of the cost. We had no choice. We were told ahead of time to pay 5,000 dinars. Wow. At the time, and we did. On September 7th, at 7 p.m., and after staying there for five days, a large Jeep parked in front of the coffee place. Two armed Kurdish personnel <clears throat> stepped out of it and approached Jamil, who gave them a list with our names, 13 people. We packed our belongings, got into the jeep and, le and left Shaklawa, escorted by the two Kurdish men. The vehicle drove right through the main street of town towards the resort of Salah al-Din. There at a local coffee house, we saw about, my estimation, 25 Jews who were also on their way to flee the country, obviously with the help of a different group of smugglers. Can you mention some names? Uh, as far as I remember, uh, some of the people that Joshina mentioned, like uh, probably uh, his father's partners, like Anwar Peros, Khdouri Dabbi, that's memory. Okay. So, of course, we ignored each other out of fear. Uh, on my way, uh, I forgot to mention, I think in Shaklawa, when I was walking one of those days, 
Uh, he spotted Jamil Naji. So he wasn't, okay. <laughs> he, uh, you know, we ignored each other. We looked at each other from afar. We ignored each other. So after a short rest in Salah Din, we continued traveling towards Gali Ali Beg. That's another attractive resort in the south, in the north, sorry. This is Ali Gali Beg. Ali Gali Beg. Yeah. Gali Ali here. Gali Ali Beg. At about 10 p.m., we, re we reached Hajj Omran, the most remote Kurdish stronghold on the Iran-Iraq border in that area. The car stopped in front of one of the houses, which was surrounded by armed men. Get off quick, quietly, one of our escorts said, straight into the house here. In a moment, we all jumped out of the cars with our belongings in our hands. Two Kurds directed us to a large room in one of the wings of the house in which four armed men and three Kurdish women were sitting. A young woman served us a hot tea. One of the men briefed us before our departure and I am trying now to quote him. He said, we are leaving for Iran. A moment of weakness and insecurity could reveal you and ourselves. And then, as you surely must know, we should be in a serious danger. We will proceed by foot for three hours and will, will reach another country. The path is near, near, neither paved nor safe. You will have to obey, obey our orders all along the way until we arrive at our destination. And of quotes, as far as I remember what he said, when he spelled the words by foot, we were caught by surprise. It was in Baghdad where we were told that we will be crossing the border by cars, as other Jews previously did. But we pretend to be different. We did not expect that it was going to be an easy escape from Iraq, but we never imagined that we had to take this kind of paths. We were seized by fear and thought to ourselves, Whatever will be, will be. To our surprise, we were asked again for another payment wow. of 1,000 dinars after we had paid Jamil at his coffee place. My father told them, we paid, we don't have any other money. All what I have in my pocket is about 120 dinars. He picked them up and gave them. They were satisfied with the 120 when they asked for 1,000. Obviously, we had no choice but to comply with the request. The four smugglers who would accompany us in our escape, in our escape asked us to leave our belongings behind so they could be transported on mules the following day. It was a clear indication that we will never see them again. So we set forth on our way over hills and mountains. The, the evening was cool and pleasant. The moonlight aided us seeing our way. The area was full of smugglers carrying different type of merchandise on mules. And we got acquainted to one of the smugglers business methods of operation. Once a whistle was heard from one group of smugglers, a similar response was immediately echoed back from the other group, a sign of a friendly presence. The two groups will then continue on their own routes. 
from time to time and whenever we realized a suspected movement in the mountainous area, we had to stop and hide. After an hour of walking, sometimes running, we reached a swamp and tra traversed it, though it wasn't easy. Few of us fell down and were bruised. But we continued in our escape. At a, now, at a certain point in time, we had to climb a tall mountain and suddenly we heard a dog barking. From every side, searchlights, projectors were directed at the mountain. We stood still and stared at one another as the lights are directed towards us and tears filling our eyes. Lie down, shouted our guides. Frightened, my uncle began to smoke nervously. One of the smugglers screamed at him. I'm quoting him. I will shoot you right here if you don't turn off the cigarette. All our guides quickly ran towards where it seems the dog barking had sounded from. They left us alone to the mercy of God at the middle of the mountain. We said to ourselves that our end uh, had come. Uh, our end has come and we looked at each other unable to express the last goodbye words that we had to say to each other as the soldiers from the mountain were heading towards us. After 10 minutes, during which we were waiting for our fate to be decided, the searchlights and the projectors went out. The barking was heard no longer and the four guides rejoined us. It seemed like a miracle was happening. Our own interpretation of what took place was that our smugglers might have known the Iraqi border guards and they might have left us to go and make kickbacks, some kind of payment arrangements with them. In return, the guards had to close their eyes on our escape. And we have to remember, after all, this kind of cooperation have always been a way of life at the long Iran-Iraq border. As I mentioned earlier, we had previously paid our smugglers a large sum of money in return for their help in our escape from the country. So, they might have used part of that money to pay the border guards. That's our interpretation of what happened. Obviously, when the guards came back, we, we, could, have, we could ask no questions about what took place, but to listen to orders. We were instructed to continue on our way none of, of us believed really we were safe. Privately, we, we wondered whether we should feel glad or prepare ourselves for the worst to come. We continued our walking in the hills and mountains. After another about 90 minutes more at 2 a.m. on the 8th of September, we saw an armed, an armed soldiers patrolling near a tall watchtower. That's an Iranian soldier, one of our guides told us. Of course, the pounding joy in our hearts could not be described. 
we had an opportunity to throw a last glance back at the country where we, we had grown up and lived. I never thought that I will have a chance to meet Kurds later on, but about seven years ago, uh, I- Maurice, Maurice, uh, 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 just stop here because of time. We can, we can uh, resume that, but I just want to make a comment on this. Maurice is describing actually almost the semi-official route, which is supposed to be from Hajj Umran to take no more than half an hour to cross by car. But they had to go and walk all that way up and down. You can now say so you can imagine when walking by foot, what is the half an hour in the mountainous area meant? Thank you, Maurice. Uh, Thank you. Nazar, please. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Nazar Jack Yahya. Uh, I went to Frankini School and we were in the same class as Hover for all our, uh, uh, all our school days. And then we separated to university, when we went to university. I would like to talk about um, our escape route that, um, uh, that we took. As uh, Khadr told you, we were all desperate to get out. And um, uh, everybody was trying to get a lead where uh, uh, for some reliable cur to take him out of the country. Um, the word here is reliable. So uh, we didn't have any leads and my father was not going to the north to start fishing for leads. And uh, Khadr told you about the sad result where people were run, rounded up and uh, thrown into jail. Uh, the break uh, came when um, the Kibir family, uh, Salman Kibir, uh, they wanted, they, had, they got a lead and they wanted to send their daughter uh, out of the country. They were, they were staying there. Um, they had their own reasons and they were looking for a um, reliable family to escort their daughter. So they approached my father, who was very well known as very trustworthy and reliable and asked him if they would, uh, if he would accept to uh, come with them, come with them. So, um, he agreed, and we were told that to prepare for the route, it would be through Suleimania. The, um, the rate was about 400 dinars per head. And uh, we were told to um, prepare um, warm clothes because it was going to be very cold. And uh, we started uh, arranging things. And that was middle of uh, December in the uh, midwinter. Um, the final word came that we were going to leave on uh, Christmas Eve because that would, uh, there would be a lot of uh, traffic on the road and the checkpoints would not um, uh, be so inquisitive. So on that day, um, in the, uh, that was 24th of December, 1970. Uh, myself, my sister Mona, my father Jack, and my mother Violet uh, were taken to the Kabir house by the um, uh, Mrs. Kabir, and we were waiting there for the smuggler. We were told to, to bring two, suit, two suitcases and no more. And my father was very... Um, was very strict in not taking along any money or any valuables. So he said, we don't need to tempt these smugglers. They are going to be paid and we are not going to have anything on us. So we went there and the smuggler did come at around, uh, I would say 12 o'clock at night in a big American car with uh, abayas to, for, the, uh, for the women. And um, after chatting a little bit, having tea, and then he bundled us into the car and 
off we went. Um, we left Baghdad, I think it was about uh, 1.30 in the morning. And uh, he took the, no the route north to Bakuba, then to Kirkuk, and then from there to Slemania. Um, there were checkpoints on the road. He told us that he had arranged everything with them, but it was just um, a plain nonsense. He didn't arrange anything. He was just hoping that they wouldn't ask too many questions, and that's how it went. So we arrived in Suleimania at dawn, and he took us to his own uh, to his own house. Uh, he put us in the top floor and told us not to leave, and we will be uh, crossing the border that night. So they brought us. Uh, food, tea, and uh, other things. Um, wonderful Kurdish cream, kema, and uh, honey, and uh, <clears throat> hot loaves. And so we had to kill that day. We together with Odil, Odil, the daughter of uh, Salva al-Kabir. So um, night came, and uh, we had some bad news. No mules to be found. It seems that uh, there was a big rush on the mules that uh, uh, that weekend, and so um, we had to wait uh, another night, another day, which was not good because that would uh, be dangerous and it would uh, you could be discovered. But um, peeping along the uh, seeing on the porch there. Uh, we saw two big bales of uh, Persian carpets. I mean, each was about two by two by one meters high. And I would say each uh, weighed about uh, one half to one ton each. Mm. Turned out that the Kabir family didn't just want to send their daughter out, but also their uh, precious carpets, which is something not very intelligent to do. So. Anyway, we are stuck with those carpets. They were calling the shots, not us. OK, uh, next day came, and in um, uh, evening came and said, OK, we got hold of the uh, mules, and we'll be going out to, uh, to the border. So it was about 9 o'clock at night. The women with the abayas, and we were going into a Land Rover, while all of a, all of a sudden, a uh, gray beetle with no license plates drove along the road, and uh, we were in panic because this is the car, uh, the usual car that used by the security people. Uh, Suleimani was on, still under Iraqi rule. And these were the uh, the Amen, the the feared secret police. And if they caught us, and that that would be the end. So, also Kaka Jamal was in panic. He pushed us into the Land Rover and uh -huh. uh, drove at f full speed uh, out of town. Okay. About one minute, we left Suleimania, and he drove into the wilderness. We couldn't see where we were going, but we understood we were going to uh, to Penjuin, uh, very close to the border. Wow. And uh, this is the route that he took. And we could see in the distance that there was the light of a car that seemed to be following us. Mm -hmm. And also, we were very much afraid. And then there were two cars. And we really thought this was this was it. This was the end. They were chasing us and we are going uh, to be arrested. But uh, thankfully, um, in about two, three minutes, the, uh, the lights faded and we were alone. So we were driving into the wilderness. It was all black, but uh, covered with snow. Uh, it was uh, 26th of December. Snow covered everything outside. The mountains there were about 
2,000 meters above sea level. So it was very, very cold. We were driving uh, in the uh, Land Rover with Kaka Jamal. And all of a sudden, after probably one and a half hours, we got stuck in the mud. And uh, we descended from the car. We tried to push it, but uh, we were not much of, uh, uh, let's say, strong men. And we didn't manage to push the car. So uh, Kaka Jamal said he's going to the near village and bring some people to help us out. And so he left us in the wilderness, uh, five people, five Jews, in the middle of nowhere with a stuck uh, Land Rover. Anyway, he did come back. He did come back uh, in about, I think, 20 minutes with four or five uh, sturdy curts. They pushed the car in about, uh, took them five seconds and off we went. So. Another half an hour, I think, uh, went by, and then we reached the mule parking lot. There we saw the mules that were uh, waiting for us. Five mules, and uh, for five people. So my father asked Kaka Jamal, what about you? You said you are going to come uh, to take us over. He said, no, 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 I will not come. I can't make it. My two uh, nephews will take you along and uh, you can trust them. They are just as trustworthy as myself. So what can we do? That's uh, in the middle of nowhere and uh, yeah. he's calling the shots. So we climbed the mules and off we went. We hoped that would be the last journey out of Iraq. And we started probably along the same route that uh, Yusuf took, I don't know, because we couldn't make anything out. It was all, uh, all white and we didn't know anything about the surroundings. So um, when are we going to arrive? Half an hour. Okay, half an hour came and went. When are we going to arrive? Half an hour. So and this is how it went. It was quite cold, I would say probably minus 10. We were heavily dressed. We have about three, four layers, but still uh, we were not walking. So we were not uh, producing any heat. And uh, we started freezing, especially uh, about the mouth and, uh, and eyes. Time uh, came by where we couldn't uh, move our lips couldn't speak coherently, but it was so serene. It was so uh, peaceful that we didn't feel afraid at all. We were there all alone in the middle of nowhere. All around us was white and it belonged to us. We all, we belonged to it. That was it. That was the feeling there, at least my feeling. So, then we crossed a small um, stream and they told us, okay, this is the border with, um, with Iran and now we are in Iranian territory. So they took us to the near uh, border post um, at the other side of the border and the guards came out and he told them Yahud. So they understood we are Jews and uh, they saw it's a family with women and that. So we didn't present any danger to them. So they brought us in and put us in a room with a stove and they brought some tea. And so we started thawing. And after a while, uh, we could uh, talk again. But whatever we did not hold on with our own hands just disappeared. They snatched everything. And they went through everything and whatever they thought was uh, of value, they, uh, uh, they expropriated. But what could we do? Uh, we were under their uh, mercy. In about uh, two hours, they told us, OK, they are going to send us to the nearest uh, border town. That was Mary One. And uh, it was because we were in a uh, border post, not uh, not a town. They took us there and uh, put us in a 
very filthy hotel, I would say uh, minus uh, several stars. And uh, waited for the morning. And over there in that guest house, we met the um, uh, Naim Musa family uh, with his wife and two children. And also uh, three Atrakshi brothers who came by different routes. And we all met in that uh, filthy guest house. In the morning, they took us to the police station to give the position and they told us, okay, everything is okay. We will send you to Tehran, but uh, you can't leave here. You are technically under arrest. So, okay, under arrest, but we were free. At last we were free. We were loafing about uh, Mary Wan, which was very, I would say, a very primitive place. Uh, some of you who have been to such out of the world places in Iraq, you, you can imagine. But anyway, people were friendly, didn't take any notice of us and uh, everything was fine. At night, we were waiting for our belongings to come. Our uh, two suit suitcases did come uh, to the guest house, but of course, no carpets. So uh, we decided to wait another, another day for the carpets, see if they come. And uh, so we spent another day in that hotel uh, doing absolutely nothing. So when uh, evening came and still no carpets, we decided, okay, this time we're not going to wait anymore. We are going to, uh, to Tehran. So we told the police that we are leaving and in the morning, they put us on a bus to Senendej, all five of us. Senendej was the um, provincial capital. And uh, they sent a police officer as an escort because technically we were still under arrest, but also probably to, uh, uh, to arrange things at Senendej. So it took us the whole day to reach Senendej, about eight hours by bus going up and down the mountains. And we reached Senendej at uh, dusk, put us in a hotel, which was much more decent than the one in, uh, in Meriwan. And uh, we stayed the night there. Uh, the next day... Uh, uh, Nazar, okay, uh, if I can stop you, uh, unless it's very important, um, you know, in a sense, I'm looking at the actual escape route until Iran, more or less. Uh, unless you have something important to say. Yes, I have something important to say, but it's not connected to, uh, to the agenda. Uh, I would like to pay a tribute and give credit to two uh, very fine ladies, very noble ladies, the uh, uh, Renem Safi, the mother of uh, Lindam Safi, and um, uh, the mother of um, uh, and Isha Shaw. Isha Shaw, who put a wonderful uh, operation in giving uh, help to uh, Jewish families who uh, had a very difficult time because the, um, the head of the family was fired from work and they didn't have, they couldn't make a living. So they went and collected contributions from well to do members of the community, all anim uh, and anonymously, and together uh, they gave it to Sitsimha at uh, Tonkini School. Sitsimha distributed the money to the needy families, also uh, anonymously, and also they uh, distributed food and sandwiches to those uh, needy children, and nobody knew uh, who the donors were or who the receivers were. And this is how it should be done uh, discreetly and delicately so that people maintain their pride and self-respect. Uh, thank you very much. That was very, very important things to say. Uh, really, uh, my mother was in the school, so we, she knew of this operation that really saved so many Jews 
uh, in the in that period. Thank you, Nazar. I think I had to say it because it was going under the radar and uh, uh, had no. to give. I, uh, I'm glad you brought it. I'm glad. Um, uh, if if you if you uh, you you are seeing the uh, screen, right? Yes. So this is topographical screen, so you can see how mountainous the area, whether the Slemania Benjamin route or the the Hajj Omran. In a sense, the minute that you don't go by car, it can take hours and hours and very very difficult conditions. Now I'm going to ask Joyce to talk about her route, which is completely different route and only a few families, in fact, two groups as far as we are aware that went that route. And I'm going to show it again on the map. Now you can see here is a complete desert, completely different, uh, different terrain. Can you see it? Yes, Nazar, can you see it? Yep. Okay. So. This is I want, a I would like to add one thing: the yeah. uh, the carpets never never made them made it. <laughs> Sorry, who? The the carpets never made them made it. They are still in Iraq, I believe. Okay, so this is a route which actually uh, basically it comes from Baghdad via Muaskar al Rashid, which the people who studied in the Hekma University know that, and then to the Madain, which is Taisafun, and eventually. It crosses into the desert, very rough route. And again, Joyce will describe it, and then I maybe I will comment afterwards on it. Joyce, please, unmute yourself. OK, yeah. you can talk. Yes. <clears throat> good, <clears throat> good evening to all participants. I am Joyce Hacham Dawood. I was married to the to the late Zohair, grandson of Hacham Sasson Khdori, the head of the Jewish community from the 30s until 1970. We were married in the year 1965. After the Six Day War, we moved to live with my in-laws due to the Jewish uncomfortable situation. Zohair's father, Shaul was arrested in November 1968 and put what's called Qasr al-Nihaya, the palace of the end. He was released in November 1969. Our son Ari was born in August 1969. Shaul, Zuhair's father, never had the chance to attend his breed. In 1970, many Jews started a escaping via the north of Iraq with the Kurds' assistance. Same year, in September, as Khadr noted, 136 Jews were arrested while trying to escape. Due to this incident, we postponed our escape until later. On, to, on 1971, we applied for passport, us and my in-laws. Spring 1971, my in-laws were granted the passport. Somehow, they arranged to include our son, Ari, aged less than two years, to travel with them to London. <clears throat> this freed us to take the risk of escaping. On the 13th of July, 71, we were approached by our friend Kamal Ibrahim Rahamim to join him with his three sisters to escape. Also the family of, the, of Mo, Dr. Musa Nurallah was included, another couple, a brother and a sister. All in all, we were a group of 12. On the 14th of July, 71, minivan came to pick us last. So the whole group of 12 already in. The first part of our escape took up approximately one hour, driving on a paved straight road. Then all of a sudden, 
the driver turned right off the road on unmarked sandy roads. Two hours later, the van stopped near an open pickup big truck waiting for us. We were told by the smugglers to get on it. Now, we started our second leg of our escape journey in the desert, driving, <clears throat> driving about one hour, we reached a spot, got out of the truck to rest. Time was around 6 p.m. There we were informed by the two smugglers that it's too late to cross the border same night as promised. The, the, some hearing that some of the group got panicked. The smugglers didn't expect such a reaction. So Zuhair approached the smugglers and persuaded them to give him a rifle so the group will feel protected. Now it's getting darker. We got again on the open truck, continuing our desert route. After a, a, a while, we reached a place where a pack of eight donkeys with their guide waiting for us. The smuggler and the guide somehow managed to push six of them, six of the donkeys to mount onto the truck. The donkeys were sitting in the middle between us as we seated on two sides of the truck. Again, we continued our journey about five hours, where we reached a high plateau about 11 p.m. We were told to leave the truck and wait there with one smuggler with us. The reason was they had to go back to bring us food and water. They also, they took the donkeys with them. While waiting there, I had the, I had the time to observe the incredible clear sky full of shining stars close each to other, a breathtaking view. Few hours went by, we saw a vehicle light moving towards us. The smuggler who stayed with us thought, it's not our truck. He ordered us to lie down in order not to be exposed. After a short while, he realized it's our truck. So, ah, thank God, we felt safe. They arrived around 4 a.m. Without the donkeys, they took them to the point where we will start our escape journey. Almost no one had the appetite to eat the barbecued meat in the early hours of the morning, let aside the jug of dark water. Again, we, get, we got on the pickup truck for a short ride this time to find a natural trench so we can spend the whole day until our move towards the border. They covered the trench with white cloth to shield us from the hot July sun. About 5 p.m. last time riding the pickup truck, we arrived at a certain spot where the six donkeys waiting there. Around 6 p.m. we started our journey. Part of the group mounted on donkeys. The riding group exchanged positions with the walking ones. Only Zuhair walked all the time the last with the other smuggler. Now the master smuggler was guiding in the front with the rifle on his back shoulder and the upper arms resting on it. The terrain was full of cracks, fissures, and a lot of desert spawns. While traveling, we heard the sound of barking dogs, saw the lights of villages very far away. We signaled to the smuggler to stop to for a rest. He declined. It's too risky. We had to be in absolute silence all the way. Hours went by, we reached a small, a small <clears throat> shallow stream. 
we had to cross it. When reaching the other side, we were permitted to rest and the smugglers were a bit relaxed. Continuing our journey for some time, not long, we reached a place where the smuggler told us, that's it, you are in the Iranian border, which, which wasn't true. We discovered that later. What I'm talking, it's taking hours and hours. The time was about 2 a.m. The master smuggler told Zuhair, we are leaving you all now, and explained that three donkeys were left for us. They were to they were tied so much so so not 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 to escape. The smuggler explained to Zuhair, on the first light of the morning, you lead. In front of you, you will see a route that that have a route. <clears throat> an unpaved, sun, sandy, uh, sandy, narrow route and it, that you have to keep on going straight all the way until you reach the Iranian police station. It's color brown reddish. The three of us, Zuhair, me and Yvonne Rahamim, riding on the donkeys, we started our journey. The rest of the group, nine of them said they want to wait for us where we, we left them and we come back with the Iranian police to pick them up and to pick them up. We started going on the ascending, on the ascending unpaved route, maybe more than four or three or four hours. The sun is getting hot and we saw nothing. All of a sudden, a big truck on high speed came towards us from the top of the road. On it were about 40 armed Kurdish Iranians. <clears throat> he stopped, the, the, the driver stopped suddenly and signaled to us to get on the truck. We told him we are Kalimi. He, he nodded his head. Meanwhile, all 40 armed ones went down in a combat position. We had to explain manually, manually to the driver that there are more people waiting to be rescued. When we all were set, were, we, we got, we got the, the, the rest of the people and when we all were safely in the truck, Dr. Nuralla sat beside the driver spoke with him Persian. So he understood from the driver that three Iraqi border police came out of their station from the side, coming towards us. Only at that time, the Iranians spotted us and came to our rescue. We only felt safe when we got into the Iranian police station. By the way, we had a very delicious meal. And that's how we knew that the, the smugglers left us on the Iraqi, on the Iraqi borders. When, when we reached Tehran, well, we went to a, a village and it took uh, some time uh, to cut the story short. When we reached Tehran, we felt for the first time free at last, having such enjoyable time with my uncle's family, Zuhair relatives. We rejoined with our son, Ari, in Israel after two months of his departure on the 4th of August, 71. Okay. Yeah. What I'm speculating, this is the road, which is basically today's road from Baghdad to Iran. Most likely it was not in that shape in the 50 years ago but at least it takes you around the area where they actually walked. You can see all this desert road, very rough terrain, and yeah. somewhere around here where the border, they could have been got out of the main road into the sandy roads, smuggling road, and eventually cross somewhere around this area, in and out, it's like a triangle here, 
uh, and uh, probably they recrossed into Iraq or near the Iraqi border and not the Iranian border. But eventually they got here and, and, and got out. Okay, thank you, Joyce. Now uh, I call on uh, Lily to basically describe a, a route that they took, which is actually the Arbil Hajj Omran route, which is uh, Maurice mentioned. However, this is a completely different uh, way of traveling. I would uh, describe it in front of all the others who uh, left in 1970 and also 1971. This is a kind of the Tariq uh, al umara of the princes. <laughs> in the sense, everything was organized. Lily, please. Okay, here. Hi, yes. Lily. Okay, Hi. great. Hi. So yes. Hi, back, everybody. back to the map of uh, Arbil Hajj Omran, uh, assuming that this is the road, which is the most defined road because it's a road where all the resorts that we know uh, in the 50s and 60s lie on this road, the Shaklawa Salah Din. So I would expect it's the right road. But now uh, Lily is going to describe how it's her journey. Um, yes, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Lily Mandelawi, so. Um, and I escaped uh, with my family in uh, August 1971. But my escape, our escape was luxurious comparing to the other stories, but not without uh, different obstacles. Um, even starting in Baghdad. We were, uh, with the tense atmosphere in Baghdad, my, my family wanted very much to leave Iraq. But my grandparents were not able to escape as my grandfather had health problems. Uh, but at last he got a passport in May, 1971. My grandmother was to travel with him too, but not their daughter, which was, she was uh, about 20 years old. She was not permitted to uh, accompany them. Um, we planned to escape after their departure. So they sold their furniture, ele electric appliances and carpets, and we took the opportunity to sell some of ours uh, together with them to avoid suspicion, just suspicion. Few days before their flight, the Bath Security Services arrested my father and my aunt's, my aunt's husband, Abraham, and his neighbor, uh, Naji uh, Cohen. Uh, they came at nine o'clock in, uh, in the evening to our house to take my father. My mother cried in the street and begged them not to take him. She tried to prevent them from taking him, but uh, it was not, uh, nothing helped. They said it will take only half an hour and he will be back. If you want, you can follow us in your own car. Well, that was it. Uh, this was the same sentence they said to every Jew they arrested, and uh, we know that uh, some of them uh, didn't survive the, the uh, prison, or some of them were hung publicly, and uh, etc. So we knew this is the end, no chance of their coming back, and my grandparents will not leave when both their sons-in-law sons in are in prison. But early in the next morning, a miracle happened. We suddenly see, so my father came back. He came back. He, Abraham, his brother-in-law, and Naji, the neighbor, <clears throat> were released. The story was that the Baathist uh, who arrested them called his super superior to inform him that they arrested three Jews. He was cursed and shouted at and got the reply, you idiot. Don't you know that we have orders not to take any more Jews, not to arrest any more Jews now? Release them at once. So they were released. It was May 1971. They managed to hide this uh, incident from my parent, my grandparents uh, because they had to leave and they took the flight eventually to Istanbul uh, to our relief. Now we have to organize our escape. First to go is my young uh, aunt, separated from her parents. 
So on July, she joined a, a Jewish family and they made their way to Kurdistan, but uh, they were followed by the Ba'ath security agents. They were Muqabarat or Amen. So terrified from being caught, they returned to Baghdad. Suddenly we see her in our doorstep. The plan was that our family later on will, uh, with my younger aunt, uh, is to escape first. Then if we succeed to reach safe harbor, safe uh, grounds, we send a message to my other aunt uh, with her family in Baghdad, so they, uh, in order to, uh, so they can uh, follow us. If we are caught, at least my aunt and her family can be saved um, in Baghdad, and they will even may, uh, might be able to take care of us if, we're, if we are thrown to prison. Finally, we were informed by Naim Afal that uh, we can go on the 1st of August. My father asked to leave only after the end of Tisha B'Av, Motzei Tisha B'Av, not before that. We were six people. We paid 350 dinars each. We packed, uh, preparing for our escape, we packed, of course it was very secret and discreet. We didn't uh, speak about it. We hardly knew, we children, we hardly knew about it, but my mother uh, had to uh, share it with us because we packed uh, our single suitcase in our uh, father's cousin's house. Uh, and my mother sent us with a, me and my brother with a plastic bag each time with a shirt or a dress or something like that um, to avoid suspicious, suspicion. But uh, the problem is, was that uh, in the corner of our, of our street, there was the offices of the Amin, the Mohabarat, or uh, I don't know, but anyway, a guard was standing there on the, on, on the gate, in the gate, uh, at the gate. And uh, so we had to, to cross the street and go uh, on the other side of the street and uh, have our eyes uh, down on the ground, not to be uh, caught. So we took the, the uh, taxi from the cousin's house. And uh, it was a Sunday. We took the, the, the taxi to the train station. And uh, my father went to buy the tickets uh, for the six of us. Uh, it's my parents, my aunt, and we three children. It was for the first class because it was a long trip through the night. We all sat on the bench in the train station. Next to my mother sat a Muslim woman covered with black abaya. She held a bottle of water and she washed her hand, sure her mouth and spat, spat the water on almost on my mother's feet. Very unusual and unexpected behavior from such a Muslim woman. It was the hottest days of the summer, August. It was Tish Abab, the, the, the heat was at its peak as we say, as we say, and my mother and my aunt and me put on long sleeve blouses and buttoned up to, to the collar. Beneath all the sleeves and uh, the, the collars, we had uh, our gold chains and bracelets. Um, it did not look good that we are uh, we were wearing like that, but we had no choice because jewelry was our insurance uh, with which we can pay and bribe if needed. So this woman looked at us all the time. She was watching us and we tried to avoid her. She put her hand on my mother's full handbag and asked why your handbag is so full. What do you have it inside it? My mother said, I have my lipstick and my face powder and looked at the other to the other direction. She had she had other jewelry in her purse. Uh, so it was obvi obvious that this woman worked for the Amen, 
the security service and she was watching us. At last we got on the train, very stressed. The inspector arrived and asked to see the tickets. There were, they were in my mother's handbag, confused and frightened. My mother gave him the, uh, the whole handbag where she kept the tickets. My father saw, saw that and uh, in an instant he slapped her hand and gently and said, didn't you hear the inspector? He wants only the tickets. He's asking for tickets. This is to, to show how nervous we were, how uh, we couldn't uh, think. And uh, we just uh, behaved very uh, nervously and we were terrified. So uh, at last we got uh, to our bill the next morning. We, we had all the time, all, all the, the night, the trip all the night. Uh, the next morning we arrived to our bill after a sleepless night, although we had a luxury air conditioned booth. We took the taxi, we took a taxi to Hajomban, Darben, like as if we are a normal family spending a vacation in the beautiful area of Kurdistan. Kurdistan. We didn't talk on the way in the taxi. Very unusual behavior. Behavior. Even my six-year-old sister was silent all the way. She whispered to my mother that she was hungry, but the food was in the back trunk, and my mother told her to be patient. We arrived to a checkpoint with few soldiers. The taxi driver stopped. The soldier asked my father, where are, we go where, where are you going? And asked for his identity card. He read my father's name aloud. Murad Eliahum Murad Mandelawi. Are you Christian? It took my father a second to reply, but it was eternity for us. We could hear our hearts beating. So yes, but my father answered. Ahlan was Ahlan Beat, he said. Welcome, said the soldier, and he let us pass through. What a feeling. It was really a relief, stress and relief at the same time. So my father changed his family name from Shberu. We were lucky. Shberu, a Jewish name, to Mendelawi. After the, the departure of his uh, family in the state in uh, 1951, he felt safer not to be recognized as a Jew from his name in those difficult times. So he and uh, another cousin stayed behind <clears throat> and he waited um, for the government to uh, uh, take up the restrictions on the uh, businesses and property of the Jews and maybe save something. So we passed this uh, another obstacle. We made our way up north through beautiful mountains, green trees uh, beneath cliffs, waterfalls. So it could have been a very great vacation, but uh, at least we know we enjoyed the amazing view. The drivers suggested to stop and buy a Coca-Cola for the little girl, but we urged him not to do so, to go on. My sister waited without complaining. Suddenly, the taxi driver stopped. We had a flat fire, uh, a tire. With every, stop, we we were, with every stop, we felt the danger over our heads even more. We wanted to arrive as soon as possible to our destination, which was Darben, Hajj Omran Darben, where we uh, have to meet the contact person. The driver went to the near village to get help. We waited there, restless. At last, we could go on. All the way, we checked that no car, no cars are following us, especially those white, those white beetles of the bath agents. But we had to be cautious and not to be to make the driver suspect that we are Jews. Uh, finally, we arrived to a beautiful place with a narrow stream with clear water, small shack by the water, by the cool water, like paradise. This was the village uh, or the um, place that uh, the meeting point. Up the slope, there was a small building and open terrace. My father met the Kurdish, Kurdish contact person and gave him the password. 
it was in the early afternoon and we were told to rest until the night. It was still Sunday, uh, it was Monday, the 2nd of August. There, uh, there were other families, Jewish families, who came independently as we did, but uh, we did not interact with them. We ignored them with pretending we don't know each other. We all knew that we had to be cautious. At about 8 uh, p.m., the Kurdish man called us to come up to this uh, plateau, to this uh, coffee uh, restaurant. And um, he pretended to fix the lights and doing so he put them off. And then we sneaked behind the building silently to two uh, pickup cars with open trunk in, in, truck in the back. We were 18 people stuck in our car. I, I couldn't even sit. I hold the handle above my head, above me, and I'm hanged like that all the trip, all the, the, the way, which was about 35, about 30 and, or 45 minutes. We drove with, with no lights. From far away, we could see lights of following us of other cars. And this was really, frightening. We thought that maybe the bat were following us. Uh, we reached a dark and deserted top of the hill. There we were told to wait to be picked up. We, we uh, got up the uh, cars. So we were told to, to wait there to be picked up by other, uh, that we will be to, pick, to be picked up uh, by other Kurdish, Kurdish cars. <clears throat> we waited there, standing completely silently in, a, in that darkness under the stars. Uh, it was a des deserted place. It was very cold. My father carried my sister covered with a blanket. The baby of the other family sta started to cry. My sister said she dropped her shoe and she was hushed right away. Uh, we were very terrified. We did not know uh, whether someone will, re will really come for us or maybe we will be caught uh, by the Amen, by the Mohabarat or the security uh, police, or maybe be a good meal for the beast in the mountain. In the mountain. About 20 to 30 minutes uh, passed until two cars came for us. We drove for another hour or so in the darkness and reached a shack. We went down, not knowing what will happen. There were few Kurdish people who wrote down our names. We were offered hot tea and realized that we can calm down a little. We were in a Kurdish territory of Mullah Mustafa Barazan. Later, we learned that our names were sent from there to Israel. Now we were taken in cars to cross the border. My, my aunt and I, sat in front in the front seat and the others in the back our kurdish driver was fair slightly hair red hair he was in a good mood and talked with us but we were too nervous and suspicious he said well in few minutes we will cross the border to iran and leave the iraqi territory you can change your mind do you want me to turn back for a second, we were terrified. His good humor was a very bad joke for us. He laughed and said that he was joking, and I think it was Masoud Barazan. We crossed the border without any problems. At last, we left Iraq, reached Iranian territory. We drove to the border, town Khana, and were taken to a small inn, a very filthy one, like. Nazar uh, described before, but it was the, for us the best ho hotel in the world. It was after one o'clock a.m. It took us, our trip lasted for about five hours. We woke up early in the next morning, ate a, a light breakfast and the bus waited for us to take us to Tehran. So it was really unbelievable feeling of freedom. We reached Tehran, Hotel Sinai, at 9 p.m., it was Tuesday, uh, three days after, after two days, actually. There we couldn't believe uh, our eyes, a little Baghdad, 
with a lot of our friends who disappeared suddenly from Baghdad a few days ago. They waited for us in the entrance to see who are the lucky ones who succeeded to escape this time. So we were thankful to, for our clean and luxurious room, not, not, nothing like the inn in Khana. Uh, we met uh, David Fatal and learned that our names were sent to our families in Israel, that they, are, they already know that we reached Tehran. My grandparents called us, called us from Israel and the excitement was really immense. It was like a miracle. They talked with my mother. My mother talked with her sister that uh, who left uh, in the Tuskegee in 19, 20 years ago, 20 years earlier in uh, the Tuskegee. Okay, Lily, thank you very much. Uh, we already, by the way, thank you all the participants uh, thank you for all the people who stayed with us. Uh, we got to two hours, believe it or not, although I wasted a bit of uh, time when I spoke twice. Uh, but uh, you, as you can see, even uh, Lily, which is uh, supposedly the easy route, it was not that easy. Uh, believe it or not, I think we still have 195 people listening. And I think at some peak, it was over 260. So, uh, you know, if anybody would like uh, to stay with us, I'm happy to keep it open. And if anyone want to ask questions, uh, please do via the chat and we will uh, answer them. If so not- in the meanwhile, I just wanted to say, uh, because it, I mentioned Tisha B'Av, uh, it was Tisha B'Av 2,600 2, years after the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem and the temple that it, we made the opposite way and came back to Eretz Israel. Thank you. Uh, if anybody would like to stay, I want to show you something if you have the time. I'm going to share a screen and I show you a couple of short videos if you are happy to do that. Just a second. Can you, can you see the screens here? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. This is about the smugglers in Hajj Umran. Can you have a full screen? This is Gali, Ali Gali Beg. This is the Tehran of Hajj Umran. It's under zero. Minus 10 degrees centigrade. These are the smugglers. From Kurdistan, crossing the mountains to the other side from Iraq to Iran. This is Iraq, Iran, this is Hajj Umran. These are smugglers smuggling any, anything. They're actually smuggling fuels from Iran. So you can see the mules or horses. Okay, so uh, I will show you another one. This is uh, winter conditions in Slemania. This is what you crossed at night, Nazar, all the people who crossed Slemania. And this is a probably 
50 years hence with a good road. <laughs> This is a wide road. I think it's uh, definitely the main road to between uh, Slemania and Penguin. But uh, I'm sure 50 years ago it was much narrower road and much worse condition. But it gives you a, a feel about what you did not see in the in the daytime. Okay, this is uh, the area where Joyce actually walked. She may not have seen light, but I want to show you, okay. So it's not straight flat. Somewhere it's a flat. Somewhere are very, very. I'm sure she didn't. Joyce did not walk here, but uh, this is the terrain, which is we calling it desert. These are the uh, maybe the Khanadak or the uh, uh, the hiding uh, um, trenches that you hide in them. Okay, that's it guys. Uh, I'll go back into non-sharing, stop share. Okay, anyone would like to make comments or talk? If not, then uh, thank you very much. It was an enjoyable, I hope you, you enjoyed it. I pay tribute to all these people who had the courage really uh, to go into the dark just to try to get out from ah, Lizette. Okay. Just a second, Lizette want to talk and it's impossible for her not to talk anyway. Finish. La la la. Okay. Well, I tell you. And I went through Arbil Durban and up to now I'm grateful I did it that way. It was an easy way, but uh, Joyce's was this very scary. And when you say it in Arabic, Joyce, it's even scarier. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, everyone. It was fascinating, but uh, what you did now, you showed us the terrain. I think encapsulates the whole story for everyone. It's very important. If you do this again, I would show the terrain before the stories because it's, um, it drives, it's, it really drives home. Yeah. Like the people who were in, in, uh, in winter, like Elsie at the time and Edwina, they all didn't have boots and they had to go in the snow and be on that mule for hours in the cold. If I do it now in Canada with my Canadian clothes, I freeze. <laughs> That's it, thank you. Thank you, Lizette. Anyone would like to say anything? I would like to call on uh, all our friends or uh, people who escaped um, to uh, write down their stories and uh, you know, to uh, have this evidence, very important. Okay, thank you. Good night or good evening. Those in uh, still uh, 